welcome to this CodeBuddies.org live code hangout. By joining a hangout, you can ask questions, work on tutorials, share ideas, or pair program on open source projects. Today, we're going to continue working on an open source project. We're doing a data migration from a Drupal-based website to Wagtail CMS. Over the course of the last year, we've worked on kind of building all the, well, most of the features out for the Drupal site in Wagtail CMS. Uh, you know, we've got an e-commerce bookstore, we've got the online magazine, community sections, memorial minutes, contact form, um, basic subscriptions. Um, but what we need to do now is migrate some of the website data over and make a last, you know, series of adjustments to the features. Try them Try them out, kick the tires, see if there's any shortcomings. We hope to have the project sort of delivered in the next couple of months, but we've been saying that for a few months, so it's hard to tell. <laughs> um, projects go, just estimation is difficult. But a lot of learning the entire way. So what we're doing, though, to migrate the data is we're exporting the data from Drupal in CSV format, and there's a Drupal plugin called Data Export that you define views and you specify that it's a data export view, and it lets you choose JSON or CSV, I think, or XLSX, uh, maybe a couple more formats. Once I've got the, then you can you know specify the columns and some other nice uh, configuration options that uh, that views gives you. Once I've got the data locally, though we need to write parsers to bring the, to basically open the CSV in Python environment and map each row to an instance uh, in the database, these database models. So, for example, we have magazine authors uh, who, who write art, like articles, basically, and uh, those authors can be either people or organizations or Quaker meetings. So when we're importing this big spreadsheet of I think around 2,700 authors, we can look at the exact numbers in a minute. For each role we need to check what kind of entity it is and map the spreadsheet columns to the right um, attributes in the, in the table basically was what this ORM class maps to. So we've got a given name and a family name column column for a person. A meeting just has, oh man, a meeting type and a description. This is going to be a challenging one. Um, each, each step of the way we get <laughs> to find a few little nuances that are going to be um, challenging, but we're going to have to make this meeting type optional because we haven't really, we haven't really been keeping that metadata in the way we could really easily export from Drupal. So that'll be a little bit of manual work, no problem. But it means just, I can't import it directly if this field is required. So making it optional is a stopgap for there. Um, then the other one is for organizations. They have a title, which is inherited from this Wagtail page model. And then these other fields are the ones we've added. So um, description website. I've added in the previous um, session a Drupal full name uh, attribute to these models. And I'll load the data up here just so, um, just for context. We haven't actually opened LibreOffice, so it's going to take me just a moment. But essentially, in the Drupal, we've been storing these magazine authors as what's called a taxonomy, which is kind of like a keyword tagging um, table. You can define different taxonomies and associate them with. Um, various content types in Drupal, but by default taxonomy uh, items are just a single string. You can add fields, Let's see. Oh, come on. to a taxonomy, but we have not been doing that. So essentially what we have, yeah, this is good, are a bunch, like around, I think around 2,000 authors that come straight out of Drupal as just what we're calling the Drupal full name column, just for to be explicit. It's really the full name and 
for all these cases is pretty much first name, last name, but there are a lot of exceptions, to be honest. Uh, there's some people that have middle initial, some people that have like a nickname, some peop sometimes there's just an error, which we've just had to clean up the data, that's why we have this deduped and cleaned, uh, because it, inherently when you're migrating data, uh, it's a great opportunity to, to do house cleaning, and oftentimes you will just find uh, errors that Usually human errors, simple things, just over time, data gets messy. It's kind of the way of the gun, yeah, so to speak. Let's see another example here. Some people have hyphenated last names, which isn't so big of a deal. So my naive approach with the first step, first pass over the data, is just to, to um, kind of split it into a list in Python um, by white space. Split each of the, so a dot comma n dot Whitehead, would, you know, that would be a list, a three-item list. And then to take the, um, basically the last item in the list and put it in the family name column, and then the remaining items in the list concatenate them back into the given name column. And that w works for m the majority of cases, even, you know, hyphen uh, initials and um, some uh, combinations where you have a f maybe a first initial and full middle name, I don't know. But inherently, the automated approach uh, is not going to know the, the nuances of the data. And Mary Klein, the editor of Western Friend, went row by row in the spreadsheet, and she corrected items. So whether it's a person, and she said, well, instead of A. F. Anderson, I want this to be Alfred F. Anderson. So this is stuff that only you know a human could really do. So then we have given name and family name that were automatically split. We have corrected given name and corrected family name that were automatically split. Those are for people. Those are the two cases of authors who are people. As you can see, I uh, originally was looking at the person model because in our database, a person has a given name and a family name. So there, we've got those split out now. And we'll look at the code for parsing the data momentarily. I'm just going to review a couple more things about the spreadsheet. Now, not everybody... Not every author is a person. Some some authors are organizations, and some authors are meetings. So in those cases, Mary just put an entry in the appropriate column and made notes along the way as part of our sort of review process. And this took, well, I think, few a few weeks. It's um, which is probably par for the course. A lot you spend a lot more time, you know, doing these types of things, working with the raw data, keeping it clean, parsing it. There's a few that are organizations. And um, yeah, then less time is spent kind of doing the fun stuff, uh, particularly when you're doing like you know, data science type stuff or machine learning. You spend so much time just working to clean the data and get it into the right shape and figuring out what the pipeline should be and some trade offs, which I'd like to do more on this stream, but right now. We have some very practical projects, and one exciting project coming up will be um, featuring maybe in a couple of weeks. I've been working, I uh, met a collaborator here, and I've uh, kind of articulated an idea that we'd like to do as an open source project. So we might be having some um, more sort of co like pair programming oriented streams in the next few weeks. I'm hoping so. Grab a little bit of green tea, and then we'll start into the code now that we've got the context. So eight minutes of introduction. Um, this is a live coding session. It's not a tutorial. I'm not really good at tutorials. Yeah, I'm better at just kind of uh, showing what it's like to work with code and problem solve and have conversations along the way. Um, all the code is open source. If you're working on a project or you have any questions or comments about web development or anything along those lines, feel free to uh, mention them in a live stream chat or on a GitHub issue, or you can contact me. Uh, via GitHub or on Code Buddies, and I'll be glad uh, to work with you and check out your project and learn alongside you because that's what we do every session. We are learning all the time. So let's look at this is our model definition again. Those are the ways that you tell Drupal, I mean Django, the structure of your data. And we are writing what are called management commands. So let me activate my environment here using poetry for the dependency management, environment management, and the project. Everything's got trade-offs, but I've had a pretty good experience with poetry. I've also um, worked with pip-env, it's very nice, and just, you know, virtual-env. 
they're all good. They all have their pluses and minuses. So in our environment, when you are working with Django at a command line level, you'll run a lot of these, um, you'll run manage.py a lot, and you'll say, like, run server, which will run the server, uh, or create super user, or make migrations. Those are all built-in commands, and I think you can actually just list them if you do this. Yeah, it'll kind of list a bunch of them that you can do. And depending on what... Um, Extensions you've got, got installed or plugins, there's even more <laughs> and stuff that I don't even know. I didn't even realize I had installed here. Pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, there's some core stuff that Django just does, which I don't know much about those either. I've only used a handful of these. I haven't used a DB shell, but I've used this shell. I've used this one a lot, make migrations and migrate. I've never made, used make messages or SQL flush or SQL migrator. Start app you reuse occasionally, start project you use even more rarely. But those will scaffold your initial project, and within the project you have what are called apps, which are essentially kind of glorified Python modules, but they have specific structure. So they're very they're Django specific, and when you follow that structure, then other Django developers know right um, how to work with your code immediately. Here's an example of an app um, contact app right here, and we have a little brief def, uh, definition, some metadata describing the app, your models here, define the data structure and how to, um, not so low level as working directly with the database, but certain other things about it, like what table, um, if you want to override that, things like that, or you can hook into certain lifecycle events. There's some wagtail metadata uh, for, for search engine indexing. Lots of good stuff there. But in any case, uh, tests, which I <laughs> should be writing and I'm not. Sorry. <laughs> then there's Wagtail con conventional uh, patterns as well. Yeah, I need to learn a lot more about testing Django apps and test-driven development. So we're defining our own management commands here. And I don't know if actually you can just, if ours are already registered, if you can kind of see them here. Let's see. Yes, here's, this is our module, or our app called Content Migration. And I've defined some, basically, management commands, uh, one for each of the content types. I might make a meta command that maybe can do all of them at once or something, or a scaffolding command to start the initial content. But with the WordPress, uh, sorry, the Western Friend Magazine, we have this little constellation of uh, entities. We have issues, which consist of articles, which have each article has one or more authors and tags. Uh, and these are all done by now foreign keys in our database explicitly. I don't know how Django organizes things internally. So here is where we're working on the authors, and essentially, um, this extends this uh, extends the Pyth uh, Python built-in. Um, command line parsing. I'm not even sure the layers, but this is a, a Django specific class that will register a command with the manage pi. You can add help text and you can accept arguments when the command is invoked. And we want to handle a CSV file for the time being. Uh, going forward, we might change the way this works to accept a URL where the sort of CSV can be provided and that way I could run these on a remote system without have, having to like create SFTP session or something like that, or do wget. And a handler function, which in our case is opening a file, converting it to a, a list of dictionaries, and iterating over those. And we've gotten as far as checking each row to figure out what type of entity it is. Because each entity is going to have a slightly different handling. So let's continue. Uh, I'll just run this so you can see it's working. And I have some copy and pasted code. Um, it's not really relevant it's from the um, 
magazine department importer. I'll probably end up deleting it. So we're going to manage pi import. You can see that the command name is the same as the file name. I don't know if you can override that. Seems like you should be able to. And our data are in the directory above there, so I don't have to keep them commented out. run it, it's just going to print out, you know, I'll scan it here, but it's printing out the entity type, and I'm just ch checking if there's any that it couldn't handle. In fact, an easier way to do this would be, let me make sure there's a default, else print unknown. I just to continue. All done. So nobody is unknown. Every entity was author, uh, identified. Every author was entity was identified. These are just some warnings of upcoming deprecations in Wagtail 2.9, uh, which hasn't been released yet. Um, good. All right. So let's see. Now, essentially, the pattern will be for each appropriate entity type. Uh, we will create a new um, instance of the corresponding class. And save it. Check the data here. So it's literally just taking the CSV and for each row is mapping the columns. Oh, and actually, I don't have to refer to that. It's right here. So. And these are mutually exclusive, meaning that one row will not fall into multiple buckets, at least in hypothetically just paste it in it's a little bit silly but uh, at least for this one title equals organization name This one is person. Again, person. Now we have given name and family name. Ah, yeah. Okay, but the problem here is we've got two cases of catch uh, within the person, so that's not a big deal. We know it's a, the author is a person. Uh, yeah, so essentially if we've got a corrected name, then we'll use that here. Just wondering if it's a little bit redundant. Uh, 
person will always have a given name or family name. I'm hoping this is not breaking. So the tuple, two cases. Essentially, if the person name is cor corrected, then we're going to create two, inst two local variables. And so if been corrected. Given name equals the corrected given name. Family name is corrected family name. So that's that. It's just Control D for multi cursor to select the next instance. Uh, I don't know a lot of keyboard shortcuts, but that one's really useful. All right, so if the person's name, uh, so for a person, uh, we're going to check if the name was corrected. I can do that outside of here, but maybe less is more. If their name was corrected, then we'll use the corrected given and family name. Otherwise, we'll use just the regular given and family name. Point. We'll create a person here. I think you just save. So. Mm. In each case, though, I need to add the Drupal full name. Ah, so here's another. I should call this entity. I can just say entity save. Yeah, it's not a big deal. I don't need to get too fancy with it. Yeah, it's all right. Uh, so the reason I was kind of trying to avoid some a uh, little bit of churn is for it. Now we're in each. Um, Row, we just need to get this Drupal full name, which I think would be the case. It would be the case regardless. You know, uh, yeah. Yes. All right, I hope this works. So I don't have to reset the database too many times and scaffold everything. Oh, that's another problem. I'm gonna be... Repeating myself a lot, but this, you gotta have an initial uh, site structure in order to get these imports to work. 
a couple of few, um, pages need to exist before you can add people. Uh, in which case, actually, I need to uh, take this into account. Which where I need to use this as a reference. Essentially, for each of these entity types, meeting, or organization, and person, there's an index page. Uh, they're sort of like like Manila folders where you keep the different entity types in different folders for organizational purposes. And I'll show you what that looks like. And we're good to go to running. So we hop over to Wagtail. I can go to the Wagtail admin here. See it behind my video, but essentially what we've got is the Wagtail content model is hierarchical, and in order to define some types of content, you have to have the certain pages of a certain type above it. Uh, for example, in order to define people, we need to go into this community, and the community needs to exist. But also, in order for the community to exist, the welcome needs to exist, which is the home page. And so far, I have to do that manually. So let me just see if I can create a management command to do that. That typically is done with um, uh, fixtures. You can you can define data fixtures and then automatically create data. But I think it's decent enough to do it with a management command, like um, manage create initial content or something. So yeah, because I have a sneaking suspicion I'm going to have to do do this over again. Something's going to go wrong. So I'll just copy all of this and we'll clean it up in a moment. Really all it consists of is... Um, None of this stuff. You just need a handler. Or just that is fine. And any arguments which we don't have, so let's take that off there. And in our case, we'll import the models. We'll need, which is going to be the meeting index page. Organization import text page and uh, person index page. In order to create these three pages, we will need a community page. In order to create the community page, whoops, we need a home page. So that'll be that'll be good enough for now, and then I can improve on this later. our models um, the person index page can be created under the community page and its sub page type is person so this is how you can explicitly constrain the, uh, or the organization of content on the site so that the content manager can't kind of mistakenly put content in the wrong place and uh, confuse or lose it and you can even say there should be no sub content or no parent content if you would want to do that. So yeah, community page is what we're trying to import here. Right there. Alright, so
So in order to scaffold the content, we'll just need to create. I'm not even going to write for safety. I'm just going to do it. And really all it needs is a title. But before we can do the community page, we need a home page. We're just going to create all these page instances and then uh, kind of wire them together um, or place them in a tree. And there could be enough uh, variants here that I'll have some issues. I'll have to double check the models. There's no kind of free lunch on this. Migrating data between CMSs is tricky. Um, even in with common CMSs, like, um, well, WordPress has a pretty standardized default content structure, so maybe there can be ready-made importers there, but if you've defined your own custom content models in a WordPress site, and you want to migrate to Joomla, Joomla or Drupal or uh, WordPress, uh, Wagtail, you're probably gonna have to deal with some of this type of um, data wrangling. <laughs> So sometimes you can do it through a GUI. I think um, there's a few plugins in Drupal that'll let you kind of do field mappings like what we're doing here. So that's, that's a nice way to do it. It's very powerful and intuitive. It's certainly how I learned to start doing web development. I actually started with uh, Joomla and then went to WordPress. All right, so now we've got all these page instances floating. We're just going to put them in a tree. I think that's it. Just call it done. Uh, but rather than calling the, the save... Um, method directly on these, we're going to start the home page. I think we call the save method directly on the home page. But we have to, so we have to then, add, should use this add child, and then save the parent. That's the interesting part. You call the save method on the, on the parent. I haven't done this before, so. Let's see if it works. So first I think we want to save the home page which will still have a reference to it in memory. Then we can create, do this with the community page. I think I could probably save those, but I don't know. Can you chain? I think you should build a chain like that, right? In Python, anybody in the chat? Would it be Pythonic? Then we want to do the same child three times though
think that should be good. So we're going to test it out. Import. Initial site structure. Check that these these are all using title. Yeah, they're just inheriting straight from the page, which has the title field, and, and you can only have one instance of them using this max count attribute. Thing I'm wondering if this community page has a required field. I think I we have a stream field. Let me double check. Uh, community index page. Or right, community page. Yeah. Yeah, we have this stream field. Which does allow null. All right. Stream fields a really cool feature in Wagtail, uh, also in WordPress, where you have these fields that you're like putting Lego blocks into them to arrange content and different types of content, like as you can see your Im images. Uh, we got Bootstrap cards where I've written a custom. Um, template for that, uh, video embeds, all sorts of things, pull quotes, uh, very flexible. And then you kind of stack them together and it stores them as an, an array, a JSON array in a database um, as opposed to a big blob of HTML with uh, embedded images and all that stuff, which is difficult to parse. We're going to have to deal with that on our migration from Drupal. Everything is coming from a single, uh, like a rich text field with it's just everything's embedded. Okay, this looks good. So what I'm going to do is now reset the database. I don't know if there's a Django command for that or if I just delete. Which will... I'm trouble stopping the server. Can just close that? Weird. Now that I've got a couple of Python files open, for some reason it's able to detect my poetry environment, which is cool. I don't know why I didn't do it the first time, I think. I opened a different project and then opened this. Um, so yeah, in order to res reset this, close a couple of things. In order to reset the database, I basically just delete it. There's a little SQL SQLite file we're using. Uh, Django makes it easy for you to get started um, with projects. Defaulting to SQLite, it's not a good practice. You should be developing with the um, database you plan on using in production. Um, but right now we're prototyping so quick that I'd rather just keep it simple and not add. We'll be using Postgres in production. I'd just like to not add that as a dependency. So now that I've deleted it, we don't have a database. So what I need to do is run a management command. And that is um, migrate. Migrations are just changes in the database over time, and they typically run in a sequence. Uh, these can happen over the courses of course of years. A lot of these here are the what they essentially do is define and modify the structure of the database, not the data itself, but the tables in the database. So this is um, running all the structure and modifications for Wagtail and any Wagtail plugins we're using, as well as the um, essentially the migrations I've created you know, from each of our apps. So now we have an empty database, but it's got the right structure. All the tables are created. Uh, we're going to create a super user. So 
so we're going to log in in a minute. I suppose actually I don't need to do this right away, but uh, because this command might not even work. It likely won't work. It's kind of cowboy code, just. Um, I could show you the wagtail thing, but it just doesn't have any content at this point. It sort of does. Wagtail by default creates this home app and um, data model, which I've modified. And destroy that. A warning. So now if we hop back over to Wagtail admin area, it's going to be log in. And we'll have one page, which is, well, essentially it's a, it's a home page. It doesn't show the data type here, but uh, if I want to create a new page, oh, I can't create a home page. Hmm. So maybe this is not an important. Let me just double check here. Let's run it. What I think is going to happen is you can only have one root page. We have now a root page right here. It's just a generic wagtail page, I suppose. Now, I don't have any root level content. Fine, and let's go ahead and just run this command to see if it works. Okay, so here's the where the convention got me. I didn't put the command in the right directory. <laughs> I created it in this app base uh, directory, but you're so it can be a little bit magic. The convention over configuration can bite you every once in a while, but I think it, overall it's a good thing. Uh, any project you're going to work on is going to have conventions. Uh, granted, sometimes the magic in the conventions will be mysterious and maybe can be baffling. Yeah, so it's trade-offs, but I think it's generally not been too baffling. That's the first time I've, like, well, I don't know. <laughs> it's to each their own, but I, I like the Django convention so far. They've not been a problem. So now that I've moved the file in the right folder, it should just pick it up and know how to run it. Ah, there we go. And some, we have some validation errors, which is kind of what I was thinking. The, the validation errors are saying that, um, here's that warning of deprecation. Um, some field can't be blank. Yeah, 
handle home page save. Okay. Um, This might be related to some metadata, some like meta fields uh, Wagtail has in the page model. Let's take a quick look at the page model, the Wagtail page model. So, and I think we would encounter things like this whether we were working with a bespoke in house framework or a commonly used and adopted framework. Uh, it's just the tendency in more commonly used and adopted frameworks is to have better documentation. Although with in-house frameworks, sometimes you have the luxury of like an expert with an earshot, but there's gonna be, um, so somebody can ask um, what's going on here, but there's gonna be troubles in any case. You'll have things that are difficult. So here's the page model, and I'm not gonna go too much into it, but it brings a lot of features and benefits to including search indexing and many-to-many um, -many relationships and um, publication state. And if I think I just go to the Django shell. And import the uh, home page model. see same um, validation here in the save and full clean methods so this sort of comes through Django into Wagtail, essentially, you, when you're calling the save method, they will try to clean some fields in the data. So we just got to kind of figure out what fields are, what field is blank that can't be, and um, just fix that. And it essentially, it boils down to uh, the page model has a bunch of fields, some of which can be blank, and some can't. Uh, but some of these are auto-populated. Like the slug is automatically populated. I shouldn't have to deal with that. I've got to figure out, and I've hit this before. It could be that I need to put a date. No, auto now true should be. URL path can be blank, cannot be null. What's there? No, blank is, blank is used in the user interface, and null is in the database. If I look in the editing user interface and I add a home page, oops, I'm not right. Sorry, not right. Mm, the title and intro could be just something to do with mine. My pages. No, this does not appear to be required though. It has an asterisk when it's required. The slug is required, but I think it's auto populated. But that, that could be the problem. These are. Well, heck, let me just try it. <laughs> the slug should be auto populated.
a little bit trial and error. I'd like to arrive at a more explicit answer, but I'm not sure how to get there. No, that's not it. Okay. So let's go back. It doesn't say it in trace back. That's the confusing part. Any people with Django background? Heck, that's it, right? Path and depth cannot be null. Right, yeah, I think it's going to be tell me explicitly which field. Mm. Which is kind of coming back to the idea that with, um, well, actually, you're putting everything into a tree of content, so you'd have to have a, I guess, a path. Uh, this is either a URL path. Or a depth, uh, would be in the depth in the tree. Okay, so let's just look on Stack Overflow. Mm, it might just be that the root is always going to be going to exist, even though I've deleted it. If I add instance, it'll work. Let's try that. So we've got a home page here. Page objects. I think it's git, right? Page objects. Git to, to grab one. ID is always going to be one. Fro. page model. Then we can add child. Everything should work beautifully. Okay, so that's the problem and everything is working good. I believe. Let's check in the Wagtail admin. So just hop back here. Boom. We've got a root page, which is kind of an abstract one, but we do have one test home page type. Um, and then we'll get to configuring a site in just a moment. child pages of various kinds so that's the good progress essentially let's just take those lines of code and those required fields are just automatically generated when doing this add child step Save 
steps might not be necessary. But okay, let's go ahead and reset the database. Or just delete the content, actually. Uh, and it is live. So it's not in this, a draft state. Boom, okay, that was cool. So we'll go back to that menu just for the heck of it. Ooh, man, once the server's running. Right, it's good. Right. And we've got five pages. Welcome page with community page underneath it and meetings, organizations, and people underneath that. Okay, very good. Now I should be able to import these authors. and we're keeping these Drupal full names around uh, will be made obvious um, later when we import articles. But uh, essentially each article is, still has the uh, Drupal full name author, uh, list of full name authors as a string. And we'll just need to do a quick reference. They're all unique. And we, at the point of importing authors, we'll have import, uh, sorry, articles, we will have already imported authors and can do a um, quick lookup and in a foreign key. Uh, connection and later on migrate these out these fields of uh, data out of there but just got to keep it around during the migration all right I think this is gonna I mean, we're just gonna try it <laughs> I don't know what else it's gonna work eventually Syntax error, I like it. And my lender probably was warning me about it. And that's just a change from 48. There's a comma missing. With the CSV, they are, even empty cells are quoted. So we're just checking for empty string here. There's no or clause. Okay, there we go. Let me double check then here. Yes, because I had moved those um, two conditions out of the author's person. Now we're checking that whether the author name is corrected. I guess we could call it that. Cool. It's kind of. Six and one, half a dozen other, but you should really just try to be consistent with what you're calling things in your code.
but at this point we are creating a person. So. Okay, this field, field path and depth cannot be blank. Okay, we're getting in that same um, path uh, issue again. Oh yeah, this is exactly why I went through that whole um, situation of uh, uh, creating the base content. Now we need to actually associate these with the correct entity in the tree and not actually the saving the model instance itself, but attaching the model instance to the parent and saving that. Okay. So... What we'll do is in, in each of the, ca the cases here we will get the index. This little thing frustrates me how it makes the code jump up and down. I hate so strongly, but it's just annoying. Then it, something to make it jump up and down. I don't know what it was actually, but uh, a little jiggle throws me off. So now we want the meeting index page. Uh, now this is the case that there will be one instance of these index pages. There's only one allowed, so. Get. I think that's it. You just get the. Yeah, because I won't know anything about it. I won't know the ID or anything. So I'm just going to ask for Wagtail to get me one of them. Cursor, it will work it out. Is it person or people index page? Yeah, person index page. Now we use the add child method. equals meeting, which is an instance of the meeting class. I think the, it'll automatically be saved at that point. I'm not going to add a lot of comments to this code. One, I think it's sort of self-documenting. Two, it's kind of one-off code. Uh, but I, I usually try to add comments. I just don't know what else I would add here. You know, the comments I usually try to add is like why I'm doing certain things is not what it's doing. It's documenting what it's doing pretty well. Python usually does. All right, cool. Now I think we should have a little bit Better problem? I mean, better time? <laughs> no more problems? 
Yeah, poop. Meeting type. Oh, right. Yes. This one I mentioned at the very beginning. Uh, we don't know the meeting type at this point, so I'm going to have to allow this to be null. Uh, in which case, now I've got to reset the database because I've got a partial import. Being a, an optional field is going to break anything else, though. false. If I just say null is true and leave blank is true as a default, which is false, maybe it'll still constrain it in the user interface, but not in the database. Let's try this out. So we're going to make migrations, which is a built-in management command. It notices that we altered the meeting type on the meeting. It's pretty good about making these and we're going to apply the mo migration, which will actually change our data structures in the database. Um, we don't have a uniqueness constraint on the titles, meetings, and people titles. So I think I can just rerun this command of the import and just have a bunch of duplicates. All right cannot be blank, so, and I think I probably could have read that if I would be more attentive. It probably told me that earlier. It says blank, it literally says blank, not null. <laughs> well, here we go. I was just thinking if what I should generate these as separate migrations or if I could clean it up a little bit better than that. Delete those migrations, reset my database. Make those migrations. So it's all done in one. So and you can see the auto generated code here. It's just taking this meeting type field and altering it. And allowing it to be no and blank. That's about it. It doesn't show a diff of the previous configuration. It's just uh, the latest state. All right. That means we need to now migrate. It's going to migrate everything back in again, in including uh, creating the initial database. Wait a minute. Which I thought I deleted a second ago. What did I delete? Thank you for Git. Nothing was deleted, I guess. Modified, untracked. Added a couple, but new migration. So I'll commit those in the same line. Running all the migrations over here, kind of scrunched up.
Chat has been quiet today. It's not quite a hangout if no one's chatting, but oh well. I always have like one viewer persistently, consistently, but they never say anything. And I don't know how to check. I think it's a bot. All right, so we've migrated. We're gonna scaffold now. another one we'll have to migrate at that okay family name we absolutely have to have a family name for all the authors but yeah there's authors like um, an example in the database is Aesop here um, has no given name the reason we're using the family name is so we can sort all the authors by family name or last name uh, so it's a compromise I don't really know if Aesop's name would be their given name or family name. I don't know in that case, but there's only a couple of exceptions. In any case, this is just another example where I need to um, loosen up the content model just slightly. So let's go ahead and commit this um, previous change where all we've done here is allow the meeting type. to be known blank. And we'll do the same thing with family name. back to the models for a person really we're just going to copy these so let's go ahead and do that while we're here person's up here we are uh, given name by default these are uh, required so we're just going to do null and blank is true I'll trail and comma here because I've done it elsewhere and trail and comma here for consistency might make that migration creates a file describing what changed and then uh, allowing you to apply it on different environments including this local environment and we should be good to run the importer again and see what other errors we get time it might be just spinning through those it's like 2,000 rows you know that's 2,000 database or well, more than that operations because you got to do for each row you're querying um, you know your first um, you've got it all open in memory then parsing it out doing some checks oh we did have one known unknown there interesting that I've known before. Uh, the only thing I change is this. Oh. It's possible that <laughs> that Mary cor corrected or will get, um, somebody's given a family name and deleted the rows in two cases. I bet that's happening here three cases. All right, so I'll just have to be more careful about it. I mean, because really, uh, let's see. If an author is a person, they'll have <laughs> at least one of these fields. Oh, dang. Return. Then if their name has been corrected, it's I still need that check. So okay, it's still running. But hey, this is good. 
I want to save it while it's running. And I think this is going to be, if I get this import to work for the authors, I'll call it good for today. It's a nice stopping point. Um, and then next live stream, I think I'll be able to do a little bit of work on this tomorrow. We will continue <laughs> importing the issues, I think, at that point. Issues and articles. Um, we'll need to import the issues first, and then for each article, we'll iterate over those and create an instance, link it to author, link it to keywords. It's going to be the most involved one, but once we get it down, once we get it done, I think um, that'll be a big milestone, and the other content types of the website are going to be more smooth sailing. I think we're just going to be repeating similar patterns, so I won't have to do so much head scratching and figuring it out and just kind of churn through and get it done. It does take a while, though. Actually, this is probably huge. Why am I doing this? Why don't I just do it outside of this loop? Yeah, I think that would be a good optimization. I don't need to be querying the database inside of the loop for each row, right? Um, even though I'm only doing it once, depending on the case, even then that's excessive. Uh, and that really could be detrimental. And then our code gets a little more clear. We can test this. I didn't time it or anything like that. B uh, baseline for baseline comparison. But what we're going to do is we're going to check. Um, all I've done is just corrected the logic here. So we shouldn't have any unknowns. And move those queries. They're, they're seemingly small, but then still uh, could slow things down. Moved them out of the out of the loops, we're not doing a query in every row because we don't need to really. And um, yes, we'll rerun it now. We'll get some duplicates. Shouldn't have any unknowns. Hopefully, it won't be so slow. We're still going to have to do whatever this does the add child, which I think is probably one of the slower parts as well because not only is it saving database instances, I believe. But it's adding, it's like calculating fields. Journaling is happening, I guess, because we're hitting the database so often. This is really a work in progress, but it's taking us closer to having this author's feature ready, so that's all we needed it for. Again, if you're interested in these types of projects, the code is open source. We're on github.com slash westernfriend. Um, 
there's a lot of patterns in this project you could follow in your own apps. We've got um, anything from you know just reg regular content publishing with um, magazine issue author hierarchical content type clustering. So it's a little bit more mm, complicated than just a standard blog tutorial. We got memorial minutes, uh, but pretty specific. Uh, but handling dates and foreign key relationships. There's some e-commerce aspects for payment processing, taking orders and uh, calculating flat rate shipping could be useful as part of like a bookstore. Uh, and we have a subscription model. It allows people to become members by paying uh, hopefully a recurring fee and grants them access to certain con site content. Deja Vid 1998, thanks for joining the chat. How is Django compared to Node? And it's a really great question. Um, Node is going to be pretty low level. Um, and JavaScript in general, I think, hasn't really reached hasn't really reached high levels of abstraction and utility and usefulness. Uh, and a lot of times you have to cobble together your own sort of framework and define define your own conventions. Um, whereas Something like Django or Ruby on Rails or Laravel or Java Spring. Um, uh, I think all of those are, are more full, fully fledged. And if you're defining, you know, if you're building projects that are that fit within their paradigm, content man, content oriented websites or even some increasingly real time uh, chat and things like that. Uh, They'll save you a lot of time and hassle. The most of your time will be just learning the conventions. There are plenty of JavaScript frameworks. I agree with that. Um, Quantum, how are you doing? Thanks for joining the chat. Yeah. <laughs> if you're wanting to work with JavaScript in a more, sort of more frameworky sense, you're still not going to. You're going to be leaps and bounds away from anything that you can get from Laravel or, or Django or Ruby on Rails. Um, but there are a few. Quantum probably has some recommendations. Quantum says, oh, that's right, the chat's working. <laughs> yes. Cool. Okay, it's a little bit hard to read the chat, isn't it? Because uh, it's a transparent background. Okay, but cool. <laughs> yeah, I agree that comparing Node and Django is like Python to Angular. Let me just think there. Yeah, interesting. There are, if you're interested in the Django, uh, sorry, well, yeah, kind of django -y frameworks for JavaScript. Uh, there aren't any. <laughs> but wait, let me not be just a jerk here. Um, you might like this one, Sales.js. Uh, I don't know how active it is. Well, they, they ask Node.js. They ask Node specifically. So JavaScript is a language. Node is a sort of framework for, well, originally, isn't it like originally developed for, it's a runtime built on Chrome's V8 engine. Okay, well. Okay, yeah, De Deja. Yeah, oh man, I'm, so, I'm going to have to work this chat out. Ah. It looks bad, doesn't it? Dang it. Sorry, let me get the chat back up while I... So you can read it on the video. And let me just think for a second. I have to work on my stream layout, but hey, the chat is working. This is really cool. Yeah, okay, Quantum, I think you're on point there. And just from what I saw on the Node.js website, it's like PyPy or CPython or something like that, right? It's like an optimized uh, language interpreter and uh, just-in-time compiler type of stuff, right? V8 is the JIT, though. Yeah, so you can clearly see I'm out of my depth here. But yeah, I think I, we can still sort of, and Deja Vid has clarified that they're kind of asking uh, if you want to do you know, something on top of the Node stack. Yeah, Django, and in fact it's called the, um, what's the Django motto here? The web? 
framework for perfectionists with deadlines, I think is what they say. Django makes it easier to build better web apps more quickly and with less code. You know, there's a lot of superlatives. I don't know what straw man they're holding it up against. Easier and quicker and less code, but uh, I think there's some truth to it. I think it echoes true in my experience. But yeah, I just you'd have to compare it at the right level, and that's what Quantum's kind of pointing out. Um, comparing apples to apples can be difficult, but yeah, here it is. The web framework for perfectionists with deadlines. I guess if I just move the code to the right-hand side, and um, the browser over here, and I'll just figure out the chat a little bit later. I'm glad uh, that the chat has come alive. And what I think I'm going to have to do is go back to another layout where I have just a dedicated black sidebar with chat and video. Squeeze down my video a bit. It's not even a big deal. And uh, then figure out on the bottom of the screen what to put there while preserving the aspect ratio, which previously I had this donations uh, widget, and uh, maybe I'll do that again and see if anybody will donate to um, various charities, uh, not me, featured charities. All right. Uh, yeah, Deja Vu, this is K Ubuntu. That's a good eye. How did you notice that? Just from the background, you could tell that? Yeah, batteries included is a good way of putting it. That's my experience with Django and the Wagtail CMS. Deja vu. if you're thinking about doing any content-oriented uh, website development, do take a look at wagtail.io. This project um, is migrating a website from Drupal to the Django and Python ecosystem, and so Wagtail is a great fit. And if you've done any web development uh, or in terms of um, administering websites and helping to set up blogs or whatever, in, uh, websites in general, and you've probably heard of WordPress, Wagtail is essentially like a WordPress user experience, but with everything good about Python and Django. <clears throat> yeah, that's a good eye, Quantum. <laughs> Not many people I would reckon know the K Ubuntu. Um, Backgrounds and they change every distribution too. They change it every. I think I'm running the latest, so that would be 1910. Ooh, we're gonna have a release here, aren't we? Any day now, aren't we? Ubuntu 2004. Ooh, Ubuntu LTS 2004 is LTS, huh? 1910. I still listed. Yeah, soon, soon we should have this 2004 release. I don't kind of stick on LTS versions, so I will update. But I've been burned, and I've, I've heard the advice, and I should have taken it, and I will probably take it this time to wait the day of the release. Don't don't upgrade right then, but wait for the 20.04.1 because there's things that happen and that get fixed right after release. In fact this a live chat on the Ubuntu website the last time I upgraded my K Ubuntu uh, or Kubuntu I don't know if you how you say it, but uh, I did it right when 1910 came out like the day or a day after and uh, there was an issue with grub I don't even know but I had to disable I had to go on stack overflow with my phone and disable some grub bootloader variable that was being set there. And that's not for the faint of heart, that kind of stuff. I mean, I've been using Ubuntu for a long time and still I don't enjoy that kind of stuff. Overall though, it's been really stable. Deja vu. Oh yeah, I don't have to read these anymore. Okay, you're familiar with lots of What are you using now, Deja vu? Have, you, have I asked you this before? I think, I don't, sorry, I recognize your name from previous chats. Quantum's very conservative about it. Oh, a fresh install. Yeah, that's always an option too. If you got your files on backup, for example. Yeah, yeah, but you don't do the distro upgrade or the equivalent, yeah. All right. How's that chat looking on the, um, it's looking like crap on the stream, isn't it? 
Yeah, that, that's too much hassle. What I can do is put a color bar under the chat, but then it, it's going to obfuscate all the code. It's going to make sure you can't see what I'm doing. Bummer, dude. This looks so bad. Here, I'll compromise. I'll put a color source, a black color source under it. Man, because like, um, I spent like, well, it's not a big deal, I'm not trying to complain. Um, I spent like several hours, like four or five hours maybe, setting up um, this kind of, uh, all this good stuff on OBS, making it fun, making it interactive. And then somehow, okay, then I need to actually do this. Uh, I upgraded it, <laughs> talking about upgrading software in fact. Um, I upgraded OBS on Ubuntu and uh, they got rid of what's called the browser plugin. Sorry, I'm kind of having a hard time multitasking. Now I think I've broken the chat. Can somebody post something in the chat real quick and just see if it refreshes? Crap. There we go. All right, thanks, Deja Vu. How's that? Just for the time being, while I work things out so that the chat can continue. And um, Well, that's the thing. OBS didn't, but the Ubuntu build did. <laughs> and with a patch version, see, I'm running OBS 25.0.7 right now, and I think the same thing on the Ubuntu Universe repo, it's like 25.0.6, and something when I went from 25.0.5 to 25.0.6, like patch level change, uh, the, the browser extension wasn't there anymore, and so I exported all of my scene I have a couple of scenes and I was trying to consolidate them. I spent several hours adding all this new kind of fun stuff from um, um, stream elements or something. But yeah, when I imported it, it's all, it just didn't work. So I want to get that back, back going because it was pretty cool. So now I'm just using like a flat pack or something. Hopefully, hopefully the flat pack maintainers will maintain that. Partially transparent black. All right, let's see. Uh, yeah, like... Uh, No, no. Where's the alpha value? The weird thing is OBS is not letting me specify alpha by their UI. But when I look at the hex code for the color, you can see here, uh, FF0000, it's got like the alpha characters, but I can't change those directly in the thing. Hmm. Hue, saturation, value, red, green, blue, right? Uh, should I do like RGB? Now, well, let me do those. It's gonna be one, two, three, four, five, six. Can't put any more characters in. Yeah, I'm supposed to find in hex. Now, with hex, it would be right here. I would put um, like zero, zero for fully transparent, right? Or 33 or 77 or on up for varying degrees of um, opacity. But yeah, it just doesn't work. And the screen color, yeah, that's just not. So yeah, that's a limitation. I'll figure something out though. Well, actually one thing I can do, <laughs> now that you mention it, 
this is HTML, I could specify it in CSS. This is kind of interesting. Do you mind getting off in a little digression about stream configuration? Or I can get back to the code. I don't mind either way. But I do want to make this a more sort of community-oriented stream. Um, do you think that alpha is a good thing in general, or would it still make it difficult to read the chat? I can make a poll, but I'll add a poll. Okay, ready? Here comes a poll. I don't know what that did. Did that do anything? <laughs> All right. Now, Pac-Man is an interesting suggestion. I don't know if Pac-Man, does that run in Ubuntu ecosystem, or is Pac-Man something specific to, like, Arch? And I'm not going to go into that land. No, no. No, no, no. Yeah, so Node's pretty low level. And it runs on everything. Embedded devices and such. If you want a web-oriented framework, you can check out Sales.js, Feathers.js. Then you're getting a little bit more frameworky with these and real-time oriented, which is cool. I haven't used feathers or sales on any kind of production apps, uh, so I can't make a specific recommendation. Let's go back to the sales chat one real quick. Paste that in there. Uh, in one I have used and um, um, production on two production apps is Meteor. I can say some great things. I can say some good things about Meteor, and probably not great things, but uh, I think it lost its way a little bit. It used to the great thing was that it used to be like very friendly, developer friendly, ready to get you up and running fast and make you know get your idea into the reality. That's the key thing. Getting real is the biggest obstacle. Uh, and then it became very like uh, scalability oriented, which doesn't really mean much to me. And in fact. There's so much to unpack with that, and there's not even one answer. So I just think it lost its path, and then it got sold. It's open source, but the company that originally created it, Meteor Development Group, kind of started their own another journey on um, GraphQL. What is the name of it? The graph, the most popular GraphQL backend right now, Apollo, which I haven't used. But the cool thing about Meteor is that like. Uh, it's very flexible, so you can pick your front end, uh, your sort of um, framework, front end framework, and it handles the abstraction of almost every other part of the development process, including spinning up a non-relational database, which I think is a major mistake. Uh, most projects I've done personally have been relational in nature, so <laughs> with Mongo, you end up shoehorning a bunch of relational functionality on there through like loosely managed packages and stuff. I don't know. And again, I just never have needed like the scale that Mongo and these other frameworks have like advocated for. All right, it looks like the poll has ended and uh, we got one vote. Yes. Uh, but it'll package your thing with Cordova. It handles the build tool. Uh, I think it uses Webpack, but all transparently. You don't have to think about it. You just type Meteor and your app is running with a database. That is crazy cool. How many back-end frameworks because most JavaScript applications tend to be very front-end centric? That makes sense. And you offload a bunch of stuff to your front-end and reinvent the wheel on your back-end. That's my experience. Or patch together a cobbly framework using subpar tools. Honestly, it's just not my cup of tea. That's why I transitioned to Python, to be honest. I'm not deeply experienced and I'm definitely biased and my share of uh, frustration with the JavaScript ecosystem, but the language is cool, and I'm not really trying to, I'm really not trying to harsh on anybody's really, you know, their work or their effort. I know there's a lot of really great um, contributions there.
in the JavaScript land. I just keep mine minimal for the most part. Back in frameworks in JavaScript. Yeah, I've looked. Meteor. So in Meteor, didn't really rise to the um, level of being a framework. It missed some key things like. Well, that didn't include a router in the core, which on doing server uh, single page applications, you need to route between pages. Um, and so they kind of left that to be maintained by the community. What else didn't they do? Well, things like migrations never became part of the core, which your data is going to change, and figuring out migrations is a non trivial thing. And really, what we want to do is just work on our app, follow conventions, but focus on our business idea or our, our unique value proposition and not become framework inventors or. Re or Reinventors or rejiggerers or kind of uh, cobblers or whatever the word would be, right? Quantum really, yeah. What What are your favorite parts about JavaScript? Are you doing more functional programming or how are you, how are you using it in your daily daily work? And the language is good. The ecosystem is. Pretty good. It's got more packages on NPM than any other probably package ecosystem. But I think that's when you look at the names of the packages and stuff. Uh, it's really low level stuff. Where you look at um, dependencies, a dependency tree for some kind of node project. you uh, you can see the how sort of um, lacking n JavaScript is for a standard library. Is essentially what I think it boils down to. As I say, a standard library is. The only way to do it, or the best way, and not to say, for example, the Python standard library is perfect, but man, it's good. It's really good. Uh, and then to have like some kind of third-party commercial entity, uh, more or less the quasi maintainers of your packaging ecosystem is also kind of strange to me. Uh, that PyP Python package index is without flaws or faults either, and there certainly is conda in the Python ecosystem. Arrow functions and array functions. Do you like arrow functions for their conciseness, or is that because they bring in the this, or the the context? They preserve the context from the parent uh, enclosure. Or what, what do you like about arrow functions? And by array functions, do you mean like helper helpers like um, like pop or push, or what kind of array functions? Mm. All right, so now what are we doing? I completely forgot. I think we did it. I think we're done. Wait a minute. Which is cool. If that's the case. Now there were some errors, weren't there? Oh, yeah, yeah, map and for each and stuff. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, we do do that a lot. It's pretty convenient. Yeah, I like the for, for each is great or for item in is also really nice. Maybe it's not as fast as array for each. Yeah, and map's really cool because you don't have to put it like a... I'm glad that you've got better... We've got better constructs for looping array over lists and arrays than having to set up a uh, counter and increment every loop. That's, uh, I really don't, don't like that syntax, even though I guess it's more performant uh, in Python and JavaScript. Or was it just JavaScript? I don't remember. Hmm, multi-line lambdas in Python? I don't think I've used that much. Hmm. To check that out. Okay, so let me just check if I can modify the CSS. The thing is, without doxing myself, <laughs> let me try not to dox myself here. I'm going to have to look at the URL for the Streamlabs, and I think I can just change the body. Let me just view source in my chat. Let's see if there's a container I can style. Inspect element. If somebody will send one message now, I will have something. I just loaded the chat. There's an iframe. 
data in. Input custom HTML. Well, I guess I can do check, can't I? <laughs> uh, actually, yes, mine do appear there. All right. Okay. ID is custom HTML. Let me just try this. Which is RGBA, and then it would be we want it to be black with just slight transparency, I think. So zero, zero, zero dot, and what is it? Um, zero to one on RGBA. Zero point five. See how this looks. Okay, so now every time I change it, though, it's going to need a refresh. That's 0 0.5. What about 0 0.7? Just use a color correction filter on the color source. That's a really good suggestion, Quantum. Dang. <laughs> Rocking it. I need to stop by your stream sometime, see what your setup is. <laughs> you need to start streaming so I can stop by and see what your setup is. Don't you? <laughs> I have troubles remembering whatever was going on. Okay, so my background, chat background, if I want to add an effect. Properties. Yeah, well, get get your stream on. Uh, if you're interested, I'm going to start doing more pair programmings in this stream. So you can just hop on this one or we can co-stream if you want to get your stream started back up. And what we'll do is we'll just spin up what's um, called VS Code Live Share. And it's a real-time collaborative environment. It'll run all the code on my computer. And then you could edit it and, and talk if you want. And that way, locally, each of us would be streaming to our own Twitch account. And then people could kind of follow, like, multiplayer Twitch streams. Uh, but it would be collaborative. Really cool. I'd appreciate your pair programming. Uh, do you have VS Code? Yeah, yeah. So no rush. And like I said, there, I have a, an idea for an upcoming project that would, uh, these projects take on a life. And this is a big scope project from what I can already see. Uh, even not, even small projects I've started have like become big uh, long-term things. So um, it's going to be relating to, well, I don't want to spoil too much, but uh, you, basically if you can get your stream set up in the next couple of weeks to a month, then we can roll on with another project. Hopefully this will be kind of um, more or less done by that point. Uh, this Western Friend migration, there could be a few tasks there. So yeah, if you're interested in a, a Greenfield project, it's gonna be dealing with some JavaScript, Python, um, and a little bit of spatial stuff, a lot of spatial stuff. So da uh, data visualization, mapping, and spatial stuff. And I don't wanna spoil too much more, jinx it or something. All right, so how do I add then filter? There it is, right click, add an effect filter, color correction. They also had, no, not chroma key, I don't want to do that. Opacity, oh, very cool, very cool. Is that doing it in real time? Can you see that? Oh, it is.
Is that legible though when I drop that opacity? I did and it the background elements are bleeding through but okay if you don't want to stream that's that's one thing but if you'd like to just jump on some pair programming sessions you can be part of this stream that's that offers stands I think that would be easier the path you know so you could ramp up the, the process and certainly uh, make suggestions for my OBS configuration help steer the project the Greenfield project is the probably the one with the most creative potential uh, I do want to get more into it. I haven't published anything on it yet, and I've been slow to do so. Um, it's going to be fully open source, though, so there's no kind of proprietary anything about it. People can fork it and, and prove it. Okay, cool. So all you need in that case is just get a VS Code installed and VS Code Live Share, which if... Um, may or may not be difficult to do. My friend John on BSD, he's, he's running BSD, free BSD, I think, or open BSD, um, had some troubles. Uh, I think he had to install it in his Windows dual boot. But I don't think I had many problems getting it running. Yeah, so just grab that and um, whisper me some way I can get a hold of you, like on I can send you a private message. I guess I can whisper you on Twitch, uh, but just in case we want to like plan ahead, I could an email would be great. I could just email you directly, or if you just prefer Twitch whispers, that's cool too. And that way we can say, all right, we're going to pair program on this day and work on this project a couple days in advance. That's all. Just a little bit of planning ahead. All right, so that's good to go. We're at two hours into the stream. And yeah, if we just have a pair of programmers on the stream, I think it's really in the spirit of Code Buddies. That's the point of this stream is to kind of be social, hang out, share some open source projects, get people inspired and in coding. And when you're, you know, Quantum, you probably know this as well, but just for s stating it, uh, when we're pair programming, usually only one person is doing the programming and the other pair will be kind of like the navigator and helping to think at a higher level Problem, help the problem solving <laughs> by adding new perspective and reading docs and things like that. So I'll be, in those cases, the programmer still, hands on the keyboard and stuff like that. But um, VS Code Live uh, Share does allow each coder to open a buffer and make changes and even access the uh, the server running, like it runs locally on, on whoever hosts the session. Um, it lets you access it like it's running on your local machine. It's cool. I don't know how that works, but somehow they you just, like when I run Python Managed Py Run Server, it says, okay, we're running at, you know, your local host port 80, 80 or something like that, 8,000. And then you, the pair programmer in the live share session just puts that in their browser and boom, it works. Sharing it, database, everything, you know, it's the same. I don't know. How, it's pretty impressive. Uh, I haven't seen that before. Driver slash navigator. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, cool. All right, well, let me just see if we're at a stopping point because I, I don't want to burn myself out, and I do have a couple more things to do off stream. But I think we imported everybody, didn't we, without any errors? No unknowns, right? That was the key thing. Nobody was unknown. It just takes a while. Ah, uh, yeah, I forgot to do the performance comparison with those the changes uh, doing the database query outside of the for loop. You know, you, this would have been one extra database query inside of each for loop. The main bulk of the work, I think, is done when we add this child because that's going to deal with a couple of database queries. So I think it's still going to be slow, but maybe this is maybe a 10 or 20% optimization. Very cool. Quantum, just out of curiosity, what kind of projects would you like to pair program on? Because that might actually um, determine what we work on. I've got a few ideas. I've got a, one um, 
idea that I've actually done some streaming on relating to music and music theory and music um, collaboration, collaboration and composition or collaborative creation. I don't know. Uh, and that's mainly just JavaScript, but maybe a Django backend or this this um, mapping oriented geography geospatial oriented tool, which probably I'm the most can. Uh, most excited about, um, but it's also a little bit concerned because I think it's pretty complicated and going to be in some major uncharted territory. And geospatial stuff in general is like interesting but very challenging. Okay, we're still running this import. You're up for whatever. All right, that sounds good. There'll be a JavaScript aspect to any of them, and Python probably on the back end. Oh, does it? I don't know how to synchronize those. I'll, I'll lower my stream sample rate. I think I already did lower the sample rate. Okay, you already set up. All right. Well, whisper me offline, and uh, I'm, going to, I'm planning on doing some streaming on weekdays this week. Tomorrow, Thursday, and Friday. Let's try it. Let's aim for one of those days. Let's just, let's not hesitate. Let's not procrastinate. And um, try it out. We can have a quick session using like Jitsi Meet just to sync up, see how the connection works, and do a little planning. It's like two seconds out of sync. Yeah, I don't know how to fix that, but I should cut, I should uh, probably end this stream anyway. You know, it might be because I'm running this import. Yeah, I know, but that can be annoying. <laughs> Audio out of sync. It could be that my CPU is like. Nice. Dude, yeah, it's maxing out four cores. That's probably the problem, huh? Double check if that's Python, because Python is single threaded. How how would it be doing that? Oh, I'm using this folding at home. Uh, and it's doing science in the background. It's using fifty four percent of my CPU. It's supposed to chill out when I'm doing stuff. Dang it. Yeah, because everything else is pretty relaxed here. Yeah. I thought I was, like, aware of other stuff going on, though. And played nice. Can I set priority or something? And the thing is, if I kill this, it keeps coming back and back and back. I don't know how to manage it. I just installed it a couple weeks ago. It hasn't been an issue until now. Have the folding at home viewer set up. <laughs> That's intense. All right, I'll figure this out <laughs> off stream. I don't want to kind of uninstall folding at home because it's cool. Yeah, we're good to go. Now, I should have a little bit of CPU back. How's the, how's the audio now? We have a little bit of CPU. You can see once that import stopped. Testing one, two, three. All right, so we'll commit this. I'm going to call it a day. Just got four viewers on the stream. 
welcome everybody to the stream. If you're interested in these types of sessions with web development, Python, Django, Wagtail CMS, or potentially JavaScript and geographic um, information systems and or music, all of those are kind of uh, in the theme uh, for this stream, basically. Currently, I'm developing a content management system. We're migrating content from Drupal to Wagtail. But we've got a couple projects going on, and we're trying to start up some more pair programming oriented sessions. Anyway, I'm going to call it good, going to go eat some dinner and work on a couple other things. But yeah, Quantum, please do um, send me a whisper and we'll sync up. Maybe we can try to, let's try to aim for a Thursday, see if we can have a little bit of a um, small session, maybe like a 30 minute live stream, see how things work out then. Uh, if you've got a microphone, that would be good too, because uh, I'll make sure your voice is on the stream and that's the main way, unless you want to chat but there will be more latency involved if you're chatting through the stream. So thanks for stopping in. Thanks for, uh, for participating. Deja vid. Nice to meet you. Hope to see you around again. Again, this has been a Code Buddies live coding hangout. By joining these hangouts, you can work on tutorials, open source projects, share ideas, and ask questions. Everybody at Code Buddies is both a learner and a teacher at the same time. We've all got um, our own strengths and weaknesses, so we're just promoting the collaborative spirit. CodeBuddies.org is open source. If you're looking to get in, uh, involved uh, with an early um, stage open source project, we're in the process of rewriting CodeBuddies.org, the back end with Django, and the front end with React.js. So stop by CodeBuddies.org or GitHub.com slash CodeBuddies to check it out. We've got tasks there for new and experienced coders alike. Thanks for hanging out on the stream, and stay well out there.